In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Good evening, everybody. My name is Father Emmanuel, and for all the beautiful, lovely faces that we have this evening, a very warm welcome. Well, we're going to continue our, uh, this mini-series of talks, which we gave it a title, Relationship in Christ. And uh, tonight, we will continue with that, uh, which we left it last week and was about... Uh, the great mystery, which was the matrimonial relationship, or the great mystery which St. Paul talks about, which is love. And that love is a, that, br that brought Christ and the church, or that Christ brought the church and made, it, made the church one in Him. And that is a great mystery, which is the love of God for mankind, for humanity, to give them that opportunity to make them one in Him. And we talked about that and we said, um, last time, uh, just a reminder, I suppose, before we go, um, and, you know, we go into this topic for tonight, we talked about, if you remember, uh, embryonic or pre-embryonic, that was like clinical uh, terminologies, pre-embryonic, which was pre-existence, and then embryonic, Embryonic was when you find a person that you want to enter in a serious relationship with. We said no boyfriend, girlfriend. And we said that that embryonic period was two, three months. You got a good idea. Shall I go f with it or shall I just dump him, you know? <laughs> no, just kidding. And then, and then fetal. Fetal was we are engaged and we are looking forward to the big day, wedding day. And I'm nervous preparing and we talked about that. And then the wedding day was the living being. The baby is born. So pre-existence, pre-embryonic is zero day. Pregnancy time. And then embryonic is between zero and two months. That's when I first meet someone that I really like and I want to uh, share my life with that person. Two months to three months to find out whether he's my cup of tea or not. Okay, that's embryonic. And then, after the two months, you go out. You know, we talked about it. You like him, she, you like her. You want to go to engagement, that's fetal. That's between two months, end of two months, to the end of nine months. And at the end of the nine months, after fetal, you got to get married, man, because the baby's going to come out to the world after the nine months. Yeah? So if you are in a relationship which I have seen, they come to me, father, crying. Boys and girls, crying. What happened, my child? What's wrong? Father, I have been with this person for the last three, four years. Well, you've been in your mother's womb four years. Nine months, you've got to get married, man. Because it's going to come out to life. Don't leave it too long, your relationship, because you're going to ask for trouble. The longer you keep it, the more problems you're going to have in your relationship. Yeah? So the living being is born on the nine months. So 12 months together, you better be married. Otherwise, what are you doing? Tonight, my beloveds, we're going to talk what happens after the big day, the wedding day. You come to the church, you stand before God, not the priest. Well, God, the priest is, is representing God there. But you're standing before the, the presence of the Lord Jesus. Will you take her? Yes. Will you take him? Yes. And then what happened? You go to... Uh, to um, uh, what's those reception places? So you go to Paradiso or Wastella, 
and some nice music. After that, the day is finito. Everybody goes home. You go to honeymoon, Hawaii, surfing. What's going to happen after the baby is born, i.e., after you are married, the big day? You are married now. You get up in the morning, he's your husband, she's your wife. No longer boyfriend, girlfriend, no longer fiancés, husband and wife. What do you do? I'll give you a few tips. And you're going to love this one. The problems that we encounter, and this is for those who are, if there are some here engaged, if you're thinking of being engaged, if you're thinking of entering a relationship, this mini-series is really going to help you a lot if you're going to listen to those DVDs later on. What happens after marriage? Why people give up on a relationship after they are married, give up on a relationship that easily, because they do not understand that that relationship on the wedding day is a new baby being born. When they come to church and the, and the priests unite them together by the power of the Holy Spirit, it is the baby born on that day. I ask you a question. When a baby is born, does the baby get sick? Does the baby get sick after they're born? <coughs> yes? Have you ever heard or seen a baby being born until they die, never been sick? Huh? It's a normal thing for a baby to be sick, and it's normal to be sick all along, isn't it? So this relationship, this marital relationship is being born on the wedding day, a newborn baby. When the baby is sick, what do you do to the baby? Where do you take the baby? Are you with me? You take the baby to the doctor, huh? Now, you take the baby to the doctor, you get the medication, you give the medication to the baby, they get well. After a little while, they get sick again. You take them to the doctor. After a little while, they get sick again. You take them to the doctor. Would you like one day, as a parent, when your, ba when your child is sick, you say, I'm sick and tired of this child being sick, I'll just dump him in the bin. Will you do that? Then why do you get sick and tired of your relationship, which is... A baby that you need to look after. Why? Why are you dump so easily? You are sick, you go out to the doctor. Jesus, through a priest. You're sick, you come to church. But where the problem happens, they go to the wrong place. They go to the wrong place. Well, let's say they're married and they've been married for a year. For the first year, mate, it was flying high. Beautiful. Now hiccups, honey, sweetie, I love you, much, much. I do, 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 I miss you, I this, I this. After one year, you know, the faces become very familiar. Okay, so what happens? After a little while, something goes wrong. The wife, where does she run? The baby is sick now. It's a, it's a one-year-old baby. They got sick. They had a few problems, right? So instead of running to the doctor, she runs to her mommy. Oh, yuck. And you go to the Assyrian mommy, mother-in-law. She goes to mommy, whinging and complaining about her husband. And what is mommy going to do? Don't marry this guy. Ash on your head. I told you, you don't listen. You are like you, her baba. You are like your father. Rock, head, rock, very rock. Mm. So what is mommy going to do? Well, very rare, a mother-in-law that's going to back up her son-in-law. <laughs> it's very rare, you know. Uh, divorce him. He can go to hell. I'll bring you a hundred better than him. And then, and then she says, mm, oh, I've got support. I've got a place to run to and I've got a problem. Now that is the danger. That is the danger when you go to the wrong place. If your child is sick, you go to the doctor. Why are you going to a mechanic? What is he going to get? Oil change? What? <laughs> or some new spark plugs. Don't take him to the wrong place. Who married you? Your mom? 
you're dead. No, the priest, the church. You got a problem, you go back to the church. You don't go and bring everyone into your life and then one small problem becomes huge because everybody puts, uh, puts their ideas into it, you know? And this one comes and that one comes and the entire Assyrian tribe come. From Bashiq or Al-Qush, I don't know where, everybody comes, you know? It's very simple. You get, to, you get to the bottom of it straight away. The problem happens... My child is sick, straight away to the doctor. I'm not going to listen. Uh, somebody comes in and starts saying, now give him this, go do this, do that. Are you a doctor? No, shut up then. Don't talk. Yeah, I'm serious. The problem that happens in a relationship is that when an issue happens, when the child, that relationship gets sick, we run to the wrong places. And very easily we give up. But would you give up on your child? No then you shouldn't give up on the relationship because that is your child. You got to maintain it. You got to look after it and never be sick of it. But when it's sick, heal it, fix it. Make sense? Another tip. So that relationship is a newborn baby on the wedding day until you separate by death, you maintain that person that is born until they are grow older and leave this world. You can't deny your son, you can't deny your daughter no matter what happens. They still my daughter and my son. They don't listen to me. That does not uh, that does not say that she is no longer my daughter because she doesn't listen to me. No, she is my daughter. But I I have to look after my daughter no matter what happens. I got to look after my son no matter what happens. The Lord Jesus, the church always Throughout the history of the world, the church has always been doing things against Christ. The bridegroom and the church being the bride, the bride is always being against Jesus. When has it been the church never broke his word? Always the church broke his word. If the church did not break Jesus' word, her, her bridegroom, the church wouldn't have been divided into Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant. It's very simple. It's very obvious we broke his word. That's why we are divided. But if we had listened as a church to the bridegroom, we would have been one fold and one shepherd. But we're not because we don't pay attention. But has Christ left Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant? No. Because she's mine. I have brought her into me as one. It is a, it's a brand new baby. I look after it. I don't give up when she gives in. Tonight... We're going to look at what happens after the wedding. We talked about before the wedding. Now we're married, husband and wife. What do we do? Let's go, please. Mystery of love. When did God first institute the mystery of holy matrimony? When do you think God first instituted this holy matrimony? When was it? Can anyone tell me? Adam and Eve, in where? The place? Garden of Eden. Very good. Garden of Eden, and that, you'll find that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, and it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, so the first time ever God instituted this matrimonial, um, this mystery of holy matrimony was in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. So marriage is the first institution which God put on earth. First. That is why it's holy. Because God uh, put, made it possible. God did it. Not man, not people, no one. God himself. So that's why marriage is holy. Marriage is holy. Now, we're going to look at the resemblance between the Garden of Eden and Cana of Galilee. Who can tell me what happened in Cana of Galilee? Anyone? Come on, guys. I need help. What happened at Cana of Galilee? 
when Jesus changed the water into wine. Yes, there was a wedding in Cana. Yeah, we were going to come to that anyway. So we're going to look at the resemblance between the Garden of Eden and what did we say happened in the Garden of Eden? Marriage was instituted by God between Adam and Eve. Now we're going to look at how can that relate to what Jesus did in Cana of Galilee where he changed the water into wine? What does that to do with marriage? Well, there is. Okay. Now let's look. Jesus Christ at Cana of Galilee was repeating what he had instituted in the Garden of Eden. Jesus Christ at the, at the Cana, that little village, Cana of Galilee, what he did there, changing the water into wine, he was repeating what he himself, because Jesus is God himself, what he himself had instituted at the very beginning of mankind in the Garden of Eden. Wow. Look, Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We will find this very verse also mentioned in Matthew 19, 5 to 6. Look at Matthew. And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Guys, between Genesis and the Gospel of Matthew, is a period of over 1,500 years. Moses is the author or the writer of Genesis. Well, he's the writer of the five books, which is the Torah, the, uh, the law, the books of the law, the Jewish law, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is the five first books of the Old Testament. So between Genesis, Moses, and between Matthew, the, as gospel, there is a history of about 1,550 years, or 60 years, roughly. But can you see that the writing is exactly the same? Can you see that? That is a proof that, who is in charge of this book? Who is? God. How can you write something 1,500 years ago, and come back after 1,500 years, totally two different men, different background, different level of education, different, different century, different time. How can they both write exactly the same thing if it was not God directing these writers? Very brief, I'll give you an idea. The Holy Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, was written... Uh, with a period of between Genesis and Revelation, from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the New Testament, is about 1,600 years of history, with, a, with about 40 different writers. 40 different writers, different times, different centuries, different places, different countries, different, different, but they all match 100%. That is a, it's, it's a very clear proof that there is a living God. And this is proven archaeologically. When they dig up the ground, it's proven. It's not like just a thought. No. They have found scrolls of the Bible in different centuries. They all match. So science proves that the Bible is 100% accurate. Science proves that. There you go. All right. That's just a, a thought for you guys. This verse, where a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, is in Genesis, in Matthew, and also you're going to find it in Mark 10, 7. Exactly the same thing. St. Mark is writing the same thing. And also you're going to find it in Ephesians, which is St. Paul. Now, St. Paul was not of the 12 disciples of Jesus. St. Paul did not see Jesus Christ while he was alive on earth, Jesus. St. Paul met the Lord Jesus when, after he went to heaven. St. Paul, his name was Saul. He is a Jew by birth, and he used to persecute the Christians. Anyone who talks about Jesus, he would go and kill them and, and put them in jail. And one day he was walking, going to Damascus, which is the capital city of Syria. Syria is in the Middle East. He was going there to persecute Christians and the Lord Jesus appeared from heaven to him. And he said, you're, my, you're the chosen cup, come here. I'm going to use you for my glory. 
and he changed. St. Paul also is writing exactly the same thing. Different writers, different backgrounds, different timing. Everybody is writing exactly the same. This is God for you, my beloved. Jesus Christ is the living God and there is no one else. There you go. Now, four times a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Four times. This is exact wording. has been mentioned in the Bible. Four times. Now, all these verses... Now, can we go back? All these verses talk about one thing. A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. All right, it's a commandment that you've got to leave your father and mother and be joined to your wife. And what did we say? Today we're going to talk about what happens after marriage. Huh, she's got a problem. She runs to her mom. Hey, don't run to your mom. You're, you're joined to your, to your husband. Run to him. Smack him. Do whatever, but don't leave him. Huh? Don't leave him and go and run searching for someone to back you up. Oh, wrong, 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 wrong. Okay. Let's go forth, please. Cana of Galilee. Cana of Galilee. Let's see what happens in Cana of Galilee. We're going to read these verses very quickly. Cana of Galilee is in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, and I'm going to read from verses 1 to 10, inclusive. Inclusive. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And, they, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not come. My hour has not yet come. And I'm going to make an emphasis on this. You can read from verses 1 to 10 later on when you go home. And read the Bible every night, by the way. It's very healthy for everyone to read the Bible every night. But I'm going to concentrate on my hour has not come yet. Hasn't come now yet. Or hasn't come, has not yet come. Now, what is, he, what, the, what is the Lord Jesus talking about? My hour hasn't come yet. Which hour do you think is he talking about here? Which hour? My hour hasn't come. Which one is that? The hour of? Crucifixion. Very good. Absolutely. What happens at the crucifixion? The hour of crucifixion equals... What happened at the cross? He poured his blood. It was the hour of pouring his blood. What is that to do with wedding? And what is that to do with Genesis, where he instituted marriage? Where God instituted marriage? Ah! You know what happened at the wedding? They run out of wine. Now listen to this. This is really important. Listen to this. I know it's not clear yet, and you're probably still wondering, Father, where are you taking us? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you right to the point. At the wedding, they run out of wine. That means there was wine. And when they ran out of wine, Mother Mary came to Jesus and said, Son, you know, a wedding without a wine is no fun. You know when you go to a wedding and you run out of drinks? You're going to say, wow, what a slack, man. Very badly organized. We came to wedding and we put $100 in the pocket, in the envelope. I'm going to take 50 out. I'll give him 20 bucks. That's it. Yeah? So you're not going to be happy when you run out of drinks. You want Coca-Cola, they bring you water. I said, I want Coca-Cola. Mm. Anyway. So when they run out of wine, the Holy Mother said to her son, son, they don't have wine. He said, what do you want from me, woman? My hour hasn't come yet. So he was talking about that wine that, he, that Jesus made out of water was his blood. And his hour hasn't come yet because there was still another three years from this miracle which Jesus did at Cana till the hour of the cross. There was another three years to go. He had just started his ministry. He said, the hour hasn't come, woman. I work in perfection. My Father's will is going to be done. My Father's will is not now in Cana. It's got to be in Jerusalem three years later. But for your sake, mom, woman, I'll do it because you asked me. I'm going to show you who I am. Not you, but I'll show the world. So he changed the water into wine. And when the owner of that wedding came and drank that water, which was changed into wine by Jesus, he said, this wine is different. This is a divine wine 
It doesn't taste like the other wine we drank before the wedding. So, the wine between bracket blood, before the matrimony, before the matrimony is different to the wine after marriage. So, the wine before the marriage is differently tasting than the wine after marriage. <laughs> now, my hour hasn't come yet. Jesus is pouring his blood out. What is he doing on the cross? On the cross, he got engaged to his beloved, the church. The church was born from the side of Christ. When he was speed, what, what came out? Water and blood. The church was born from his side. Water for the holy baptism, born again in Christ. The church was born in Jesus Christ. So, on the cross, he poured his blood to be engaged and united to his church. Now, the wine before the wedding tastes different after the wedding. Jesus gave them the wine after the wedding. What's the difference? Before the wedding. Now, the wine, the wine is also symbolic for joy and happiness. Yeah? Yeah? The wine is also symbolic for joy and, and happiness. And that you find that in the Psalm of King David. It's not from me. It's from the Holy Bible. I don't say anything from me. <laughs> so the wine is symbolic for joy and happiness. And also the wine is representing blood. And what is blood? When you pour your blood, what, is, what happens? Death. So when you die by pouring your blood, there's, uh, there's a word for it when it starts with an S. Sacrifice. Thank you very much. So the wine also is, is talking about sacrifice. Now, the wine after the wedding is different. That guy said it's different. If you read from verses 1 to 10, he says this wine is different. Because it's after the wedding. Before the wedding. Before the wedding, there's, a, there's one kind of test, taste. And after the wedding, is a different taste. It's the same person that you've just met. Yeah? Same person after wedding never changes, but the taste of your relationship changes. Before the wedding, <laughs> honey, I die for you. Honey, when I don't see you one minute, I go crazy, crazy, crazy. Before the wedding, every day he gets you flower. Every day he texts you message. Not every day, every minute. When you get into his car, you get out of his dream. He's been dreaming about you all night long. And when he sees you to get into his car, he comes running with a red carpet rolled. And he opens the door and a ring of flowers around your neck. Get into my car, my princess. You ask him for something, he jumps to the moon to get it for you. Anything, my sweetie. And you always see the nice side of Romeo. Isn't it true? Some of you have experienced this avenue and you're laughing. That's why you're laughing. It's always Mr. Nice Guy. The wine tastes different. And you know what? Another thing. Before the wedding, you always see her as Mariah Carey. She's got the makeup. She's been in front of the mirror for the last 10 hours just to see you for five minutes. And then where mommy comes, Brati, come here. Oh, mom, I don't have time for you. It's not your time. Leave. I want to be <laughs> Miss Universe for my, for my Romeo. Anyway, so you always see her in makeup, the best looking, the best dress, the best everything. And you always see him, Mr. Perfect, opens the door for you, honey, honey, Brings you the drink, he goes and gets you the food, he takes you to a restaurant, to cinemas, to I don't know where. <laughs> After the wedding is a different wine. For the first time ever in your life, <laughs> I'm talking about the guys now. For the first time ever in your life, guys, you will wake up <laughs> and you will see your sweetheart. First time ever without a makeup, and you'll go, oh, Shumid <laughs> Allah.
Police officer, there is a stranger in my bed. <laughs> I know I'm exaggerating a bit, but please, I want to I just make fun a little bit as well. But it's a, it's a reality. It's a reality. What I'm saying is true, but I'm just making it a bit, bit you know, hilarious. But it is true. For the first time, you will see her without a makeup, and you'll get the shock of your life. Ay, what is this? I thought it was a Rosella. She looks like a crow. And for the first time, my sweetheart girls, you will hear him snoring all night long. I thought he was nice and, and sweet, you know, and very cute and gentle. He pierced my eardrums from snoring. I wanted to choke him, you know, put a pillow in his throat. It's a different taste. And after a little while, no more messages, no more opening doors. He will drive and leave you behind, man. <laughs> How do we maintain this relationship? How can we maintain this relationship after marriage? Only one way. And one way only. For the man to pour out his blood. For the man to pour out his blood for his beloved. Because after marriage, is a different taste altogether. Before marriage, it was just a dream. You were not living reality as yet. Before marriage, it was everything sweet because you have not come under the bond of holy matrimony. You have not come. You are two, still two persons. That's why you don't feel the weight. But after marriage, the two become one. You will feel the weight. You will be different. You are no longer free. You are no longer yourself. You are not just you. You are her as well at the same time. It's you and her one. You can't be selfish anymore. You can't just think the way you want. You can't just do things the way you want them to be done. You can't talk whichever way you like. You can't. It's a different taste. You have to be responsible and you have to be reasonable and you have to be fair. And this relationship cannot continue after marriage because after marriage, everything is uh, just finished. You know what? Before I was dying, uh, I'm just trying to get to her heart. I'd send messages with her best, best girlfriend. Please tell her I'm dying, I'm dying. Hello, I'm here. She's ignoring me. She's not, you know. Please. Now she's married to you and she sleeps next to you. Finished. No more I need to run to her. No, that's it. She's with me. That's how she's married. After marriage, my hour has not come yet. M woman, my hour has not come yet to be really married to my beloved. But after marriage, Jesus says, for the relationship to continue after that marriage, woman, I will pour my blood for my sweetheart. I will die for her. And in Assyrian we say, A man says to the woman, that means I die for you, literally. Do you really? You say, I die for you, and the moment she opens her mouth, shut your mouth. You are, you are, you are, uh, um, nothing upstairs. When you laugh, I can see through your head. Where is this mate in Qatar? Where is it? The man is responsible. Now listen to this, guys. This is fact. The man is responsible to sacrifice. He has to start it, not her. Uh, now, this is a priest talking, so I'm not bringing anything from me. It's from the Bible. It is God talking here. The man is responsible to pour out the blood. Jesus didn't say, my, my beloved, is, uh, she has to pour her blood out for me. No, I pour my blood. My hour has not come yet. The cross, which I will bring her to me and make her one in me through my blood, which is my life. I will put my life for my beloved sweetheart. My partner who shares her life with me forever. And without a sacrifice, there is no life. 
How can children go and have education, have clothing, have food, have everything, if the parents do not sacrifice and work hard to provide for that? Without somebody sacrificing, the other person can't have it easy. And, and unless you sacrifice, you cannot continue with your life. Life stops. And you cannot sacrifice if you don't have love in your heart. Everything is linked. It's a chain. One goes out, the whole chain collapses. But what is foundational is love. When I love, and if I really love, the only next thing I'll do is I will suffer just to make my sweetheart happy. Look at this. In Ephesians, which is St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, he says in 525, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and what? Gave himself for her. Now, why, why is the man is the first person responsible in that relationship? Because when the commandments was given by God to Adam, what did he say? A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. So who is responsible first? The man. Then the woman. Now, the man shows the love. The woman's duty is to respect that love and pay it back. But the man has to start it. When it's the other way around, sooner or later you will encounter issues and problems. Because it's not her job to provide always. She is to respect, accept, and return back. But it is his job to show that love. Anyway. Was that uh, clear? Shall we go forward? Good? So far so good? Yes. Now you're going to go and say, <laughs> if you've got a, not a boyfriend, but if you've got a fiancé, a fion if you go to a boyfriend and say, you're not sacrificing for me, he's going to say, I'm not engaged to you. I'm not, I'm, why, why should I? We're just boyfriend and girlfriend. That kind of relationship is weak. That's why you shouldn't enter in a relationship as boyfriend and girlfriend for a long time because you will encounter problems sooner or later because it is weak. But when the two parties are serious about it, then they should be engaged and then get married. And when you're engaged, then he is responsible. And when you're married, he's more responsible towards you. Anyway, now, the mystery in short. The mystery in short, you will, find, you will find three main phases or stages in it. And this mystery, now that mystery of holy matrimony, we said it is a verse that has been mentioned four times. And that verse, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Now, these, this verse, in this verse, you will find three phases and three stages, or three stages. The man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The first, Genesis, Matthew, Mark, and Ephesians. This verse has been mentioned four times, as we mentioned. And in this verse, you will find three main phases or stages. Let's go to them, please. First stage. We are finding in this particular verse three things. Leaving, cleaving, or join to, and uniting. A man shall what? Leave. That's one stage. A man shall be joined. Joined is cleaving. Cleaving is the two are glued together. That's cleave. And here they translated more simple English, joined to. But the, the exact uh, translate or the exact verse is cleave. Cleave is not joined to, but glued to. You know, like super glue. Cleaving and then shall be joined to his wife. Well, the verse continues and says, and be one flesh, uniting. One flesh, the two become one. That is uniting. So, and here we see leaving, joining together, cleaving, and uniting. There are three stages in this relationship, in this marriage. Three stages. Let's go to the first one. And the three go together hand in hand. You can't separate them. You can't separate them. Leaving starts and does not end. You got to leave. You're going to say, where do I leave? I'll tell you in a sec. Don't leave from Fairfield and go somewhere else. Okay. Leaving starts and does not end. Cleaving or joining together 
before you join together or cleaving, there must be leaving. You have to leave to join. And then uniting does not happen unless you are glued together. If you are not glued together, you can't unite. Are you with me so far? Yes. Doesn't make sense? It will make sense more. Let's go forth. How leaving must start? Leave father and mother. When God gave this order to the man to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, he was not saying that be disrespectful to your parents. Some people say, oh, I've got to deny my parents. I'll leave my father and mother behind and I'm, I've got my wife now. Nobody interferes with my life. No. You, that does not say that you are to be disrespectful or deny them. But what is, this, what is he saying? Leave the attachment that you had to your parents. Well, we'll come to that more. It's called the psycho-emotional pathological attachment. Now, that's clinical. If anybody's a doctor, will understand what I'm talking about here. Okay? If, I, if anybody's do, or, or studying science or medicine. Psycho-emotional pathological attachment. Now that is, in other words, it is the psycho-emotional and umbilical cord. You know when the baby has that umbilical cord? Now, well, that's, you'll understand what I mean by, by leaving now in a second. This cord, guys, when the baby is born, they come with this umbilical cord, don't they? In order for that baby to leave mommy, what happens to the cord? Chop. Now, talking about a baby. Baby is in, mother, in, in, the, in the mother's womb, right? He is used to mommy. He's mommy's boy. He is the, he's the sweetie mom. He is my favorite baby. This is my favorite son. Are you getting it now? He's my favorite son. All my children on one side, Sargon on the other side. <laughs> so this baby, or this son, who is now married, has to what? Leave his father and mother, i.e. leave that attachment. I'm no longer that son that I used to live single at home. When the baby is born, that's it. When the baby is born, the umbilical cord is cut. I'm no longer my mother's son. I've got a wife. And what did we say about that baby? Is wedding day. The baby is born. I'm cut off from my parents. Isn't it true? So that means you got to leave that old Sargon that used to be single at home. Mdallal. You know, before, whatever I say my mom would do for me, I'm her favorite son. Mom, I need money. Ooh, I'm spoiled. I'm the spoiled son. I come. Now I'm married. I want to do the same thing with my wife. She's not my mom. She'll give me the third degree burns, baby. Next time I say something, I probably I, I say something to mom and I get away with it. That's the old son. I got to be detached. I got to leave that old person. I want to do the same thing with my wife. I say to my wife, shut up. Before you know it, your clothing are in the street. <laughs> but you said shut up to mom and she still made you oozy. And she still cooked for you. And she still washed your clothing. And she still did your bed. You can't do that with your wife, baby. You gotta detach. You gotta leave that old person. You gotta leave that old person. So you gotta leave that attachment, that emotional attachment, just like that baby was before with mommy, attached through that umbilical cord. It's nice. It's very, very, very nice, very soft. I don't hear any noises. You know, I get fed every time, and it's beautiful and comfortable in mommy's womb. I come out, it's very noisy out there, too, very bright. I get scared, I start crying. You can't, you can't get scared with your wife and start crying and running to mommy. Don't be mommy's boy after wedding, you know. Mommy, she hit me. <laughs> Shame on you. Shame on you. You gotta be a man, not that little baby, huh? Mommy's baby. No. Got to be the man and be responsible and be there for it, man. Be there for it. Now, this court, this leaving, this detachment, the parents, the parents 
should start missing this umbilical cord at the end of high school. They have to prepare that child for marriage. Stop holding on to your son and daughter. They come and ask for the daughter. Oh, she, the, the mom or the... My daughter is number one in the world. You don't see any, anyone like her. And if you don't look after her, I will kill you. <laughs> and after they get married, they stick their nose where it doesn't belong. The parents never let go of their kids. Hey, leave me alone. I'm married now, man. Do I interfere between you and your wife? My mom and dad, do I interfere between you as husband and wife? No. Well, why are you interfering between me and my wife? Doesn't it make sense? As long as the baby is in the mother's womb, as long as the son or the daughter are living under your, in your house, you are responsible for them and they are responsible for, to you. But once the baby is born, whether you like it or not, you cut off that umbilical cord. Why don't you just leave it? And for the baby to grow and be 21 and still with the umbilical cord. So wherever mommy goes, the son is going. <laughs> Does it work? Does it work? Have you ever seen somebody going to shopping with his mom with the umbilical cord attached? <laughs> They're going to say he's got a flat battery. He's being pulled by a, a tow truck. <laughs> Doesn't work. Can't you see how life is supposed to be run? The baby is born... No longer attached to mommy. On wedding day, the baby is born. I detach myself from mom and dad. I respect them. I acknowledge their position. I go and visit them. I say hello. Whenever they need something, I run. I provide. But they can't interfere and run my life as a married man. And that's where... I'm not going to exaggerate, but... 85% of the problems is because the parents or the in-laws interfere. Because we do counseling, you know. The in-laws, man, from both sides. And they become like enemies. Two, two rockets. And who is the battleground? Poor husband and wife, the son and the daughter. Don't let them use you as a battleground. They've had their time. They've had their share. Shut up. Get on with your life. Leave us alone. It's a serious issue, guys. And it's a fact. Unfortunately, it's a fact. So that umbilical cord, the parents should release it more and more when the child finishes high school. I'm going to now get them used to the idea that you are responsible for yourself now. Make them feel the responsibility. Now, mom, I want to work. Okay, good, you're working. I'm not going to give you your pocket money all the time. But if you get a wage, you better save. I'm not going to run your life, but I will monitor it from a distance. I want to see that you are responsible for your, for your life now. Because sooner or later, you're going to leave me. And if you don't understand what responsibility is, you will never understand it when you're married. And you're going to ruin your life as a married husband or a, as a married wife. Because parents are not going to be there for you always. So you have to understand how to take responsibility with your life and go with it. Make sense? Good. Now, the responsibility of leaving. The responsibility of leaving is primarily the children. The children have to detach themselves from the parents gradually. But the parents must help them and not stop them. Uh, like the child comes and says, Mom, especially the Eastern you know, style parents you know, from Iraq and all this. You know. Because in the Middle East, my beloved, I'll, I'll give you an idea. If you're not born there or, or you're not used to the, <laughs> the way they live in the Middle East, the son is married, he's got grandsons, and the mom still smack him. Don't look into my face. <laughs> and he can't lift his face. You know, he can't. Mom runs the show, and if, if she's like a strong mama or dad, you know, they run the show. He's still living with his parents. Poor wife, she's copped it for the last 50 years, living with her mother-in-law and father-in-law. And they have children, and they are grandchildren. They still can't get away from their parents. Relax, man. Give me a break. I want to have a breather. So, 
It is primarily the children's duty to let go gradually from the parents. But don't be disrespectful. All I'm saying here, don't get me wrong, guys. Don't say Father Emmanuel said, my mom, I'm 18, leave me alone. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Don't go and talk to your parents like that. I'm saying, leave me alone to be responsible for good things. Huh? Don't say I went to school and you went to with your friends on the side sneaking behind the trees. That is not being responsible. That is being stupendo. So you have to be responsible and you have to prove to your parents that I'm responsible so they'll understand and they'll back off. When they see that you're doing good in your education, you are getting good marks, you are working and you're saving money, you are proving to them that I can do it, they will back off. But if they let go and then you just go and blow it up, rest assured they won't let you go. They'll be on your nerve every day. But if you show to them and prove to them that I can do it, they will back off with a nice word. A nice word goes a long way. Like Dad says something, that was only Dad, you know, who cares? He's old-fashioned. You know, he is he's a different hard drive. Thick. You know, it's got too many viruses. I put a program, goes, you know, it doesn't understand nothing. Different language, man, different language. Now, respect your parents. Respect your parents, but prove to them that you are responsible and you can do it. Now, when you are married, it is not only you've got to leave your parents, i.e., leaving those attachments and those emotions that you had before with your parents, you've got to leave some certain friends as well. You are married now. You know, your wife comes and says, uh, you know, you're not at home. You go, you go from early morning till 5 o'clock in the evening. You're working. Okay, I don't see you. You come back. Have a shower. Run to the gym. Have a shower. You, from the gym, you go to your friends. You come back at 12 o'clock. And then same thing in the morning. Hey, but they're my friends. Yeah, but I'm your wife. Yeah, what do you want to do? So what, you're my wife? You want me to leave my friend? No way in the world. You won't even see that in your dreams. Hello? That's not a man. That's not a man. Remember that two become one? Don't think of yourself only, because that's very selfish. She's united in you now. So you've got to understand and appreciate her feelings. Her emotions, her needs. She married you to be with her. She didn't marry you so you can go with your friends. Hello. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, does it? It's not logical. Yeah, I married you so I can be free with my friends. Uh, why did you marry me? Why didn't you marry your friends? <laughs> and you know what? I, I come across this. This is, this is like, it's proven. I'm not just saying it, I'm pretending it. No, I have cases with fam, husband and wife, where they come and sit with me. Problem? Friends! I say, excuse me, man. Give me one sec. Is she your wife? Yeah. Do you love her? Yes. She's your body, do you know that? Yeah. Is your friend your body? Huh? So what is your priority? My wife. Then shut up and get on with it. Yeah, I'm serious. If she's priority, well, well you are, you're saying it, but you're not doing it. You're saying she's my priority, but what you're doing, your friends are your priority. You are showing more love towards your friends than your wife. And you say, I wonder why she's angry at me. I can't get it. <laughs> Can you turn the lights on, please? You've been sitting in that cave of Adam for too long. We are in the 21st century, there's electricity. We don't have priorities. You gotta leave certain friends. Also, not just the parents. You gotta leave certain habits. You know what gets, this is like both sides, you know? Not just the husband, but the wife. You know what gets on your partner's nerve when you say, but when I was at my mom's house, I used to do this. Now you're not letting me do it. But I am not your mommy, sweetheart. That's what he's gonna answer. I'm your husband. Are you going to run me like your mom? I'm not. Or you say, hey, I was free when I was with my parents. Now you are too much. You're demanding things of me. As a wife, you're demanding too much things of me. I, at, my, my parents never treated me that way. Ooh, that's the worst thing you do. And you say to your wife, my parents were better than you. Ooh, yuck. 
You've got to leave certain habits. What you've learned at home with mommy and daddy is no longer the case. It's a different life. It's a different ground. It's a different environment. Different person. You've got to get used to the new life. So what I'm, about to say, what I'm trying to say all along to you guys, marriage, a relationship, is not a joke. It's not having fun. You've got to leave certain habits. That means you, you have to understand that it's not just fun, it's not an easy thing, it's a responsibility. And by the way, a relationship is, is, is brought into existence by God. So don't joke with it. Don't joke with it. And guys, don't mistreat the girl. And, bo and girls, don't mistreat the guys. You've got, you've got a sister. Would you like your sister to be mistreated? No? Well, don't do it to a girl. And, and, and the girl, if you want to keep your respect and honor, show that I'm not an easy prey for you, that you can take me whenever you like and bring me whenever you like and do whatever you like. No. You have to show me that you are responsible. You have to show me that you are up to it and you can do it. Otherwise, I am not a toy in your hands. We have a saying in Assyrian. We say, A heavy rock stays in its place. Doesn't shake. It's not like a feather. A wind comes this way. Fill, 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 fill. A wind comes this way, fill, 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 fill. No, the rock, wind, no wind, stays. You know, he rings you, you do fly high. Yeah, take it easy. What, is he the only guy in the world? No. And you, you fight with your parents. You, you break the house. You break everything to marry him. After you marry him, you break him. <laughs> so why did you do all this hassle, huh? Anyway. Anyway. So you got to cert yeah, leave certain friends, certain habits. And then when you leave your parents, you leave some friends of yours which are affecting your life, leave some habits which, are, which is affecting your relationship. Then the outcome of this leaving is cleaving, joining together. The more you leave of your old self, the more you're going to get closer to your partner. The more you knock down walls, the easier you're going to communicate. The closer you're going to get. The hearts are going to talk. Not this. Because when the heart talk, uh, honey, you know, you've seen marriages. After four, 50 years they married. They're still two Rosellas, you know. Chew, 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 chew. 50 years seeing each other every day as if after 50 years, as if they have just met now. Honey, I love you. You know, Father, we just came back from honeymoon. Hal! <laughs> World, World War III just finished and you just haven't been to honeymoon. No, Father, this is our 50th honeymoon. <laughs> because both of them, they left. Both of them, they left certain habits, they left certain people, they left their parents with respect, of course, in order to join together, to cleave. Now, what is cleaving? Now, we said it's three stages, leaving, cleaving, and uniting. Now, cleaving is, the strongest glue is nowhere near this glue called cleaving. Right? You bring me super glue, you bring me anything, what God joins... This is the strongest glue when God glues you together. It is the strongest glue. You won't even find it in Bunnings. Or any hard, you know, hardware stores. 9 to 10, whatever they are. No glue like that. And what happens? Who is mainly responsible for cleaving, joining together? Who do you think? The man? Because? Because? God said to the man, what did God say to the man? No, God said, what was that verse that was mentioned four times? The man shall leave his father and mother and be what? Cleaved, joined to his wife. So who is mainly responsible for this joining together? Again, the man. Poor guys, man, you're copying it badly. This need. Mm. 
Now, who is remainly responsible for cleaving? The man. Okay. The man is responsible. Because, why is the man responsible? Why is the man responsible? Mainly because God ordered the man shall leave. Not the woman, the man shall leave. So he has to start it. He is the main one who is responsible for the joining together takes place. The man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Okay. What is this glue that brings the two into one? And this glue is so powerful, nothing can break it apart, is love with a capital L. Cleaving is a process of love. You're married. After marriage, as I said, you've got to leave your parents, certain habits that you got from your parents. You've got to leave some friends, the lifestyle that you had before when you were single. You've got to leave that. You can't take it with you. And you've got to leave certain habits that you've learned throughout all these years till you got married. Now, what brings you together closer and closer and closer and closer where you become one is the love. The love is the glue that joins you together in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Love is God and says, and in the uh, epistle of St. John, for God is love and who abides in love abides in God. And when you build your life on God, rest assured, it is the strongest ever glue and no one can separate you from your partner. When you are built on the love of God. Love is the mystery that brings two into one. Two total different people makes them united perfectly in one. And that love is Christ himself who brings the two together. You start your life, you get married in Jesus you finish it in Jesus. Don't let anyone separate you from Jesus Christ. But this is the perfect marriage. Does it happen? Very rarely. Now let's go forward, please. The two, husband and wife, would have commitments. Now because they are joined together, they are glued together, this glue being glued together, they, they got to have to have commitments in order to maintain that you know, like that gluing together. Well, they, they glue together. They have to maintain it through some commitments. I'll give you, I'll give you five, five main commitments. But before you say that, before you go any further, please, there are five mutual commitments between the two, husband and wife. I'm going to read. This is our... Um, <clears throat> uh, it is the betrothal and wedding ceremony in, in the ancient church of the East. I'm going to read to you what a priest says on the wedding day. This I've, we've translated into English, so I'll read it in English. It's not in Assyrian, so, you know. Listen to this. And what, am I, what I'm about to read to you, you will find them memorized in five commitments, which we'll see shortly. It says, the priest will come, the husband, the man, and the woman, standing there at the wedding day. He'll come to the man, and he'll say, our brother, so-and-so, you know, Sargon, of, uh, son of Odisha, whatever. Or John, son of Smith. Whatever the name is. So our brother, so and so, you have come. Listen to this. You have come with a good will, pure heart, and undivided love to take for yourself the woman. You are taking this to take for yourself so and so as a wife and helper. According, listen to this, according to the Christian law, evangelical teachings and apostolic commandments you are aware that the marriage union of true Christians who have received the holy baptism and profess Jesus Christ has no separation until death do you promise to keep and stand by her in health and in sickness and during any trials and hardship except that of adultery. Just as the Apostle Paul commands, husbands, love your wives as also Christ loved his church and gave himself for her. And again he says, a wife is bound to her husband as body and spirit and as flesh and bones. 
Can you separate the flesh from your bones and still live? Can you separate the spirit from the body and still live? Then you can't separate yourself from your wife. And the wife can't separate herself from the husband. Except adultery. And you know what adultery is. But if it's not that, just because misunderstanding, miscommunication, that is not good enough for the wife or the husband to leave and go. They are not separated. This is Jesus. And I know people are being separated, and I know the churches are given permission for them to separate and remarry, and that is wrong. And gave himself for her. And again he says, A wife is bound to her husband as body and spirit and as flesh and bones. Again he writes, Let the husband provide his wife the affection due her. Let the husband, not the wife, let the husband. Who is responsible first? The husband. Let the husband provide his wife the affection due her. It is also written in the Old and the New Testament, A man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. We were talking about that just then. Do you, John Smith, accept all these words I have said to you and promised to stand by and fulfill them until death? He'll say, yes. <laughs> and I will repeat, or the priest will repeat the same thing to the wife. And she say, yeah. <laughs> and then after three months... I hate him, Father. I hate him. Take away from me. Take him to a Torongazu. <laughs> what happened to the promise? Uh, you know, I just got up, got out of the bed, and I was still uh, asleep. I didn't get it. Uh, yeah, you go and tell that to Jesus Christ, not me. It's a serious issue, guys. Now, what I just read to you, it is memorized or in main in five main commitments. One. We commit, the husband and wife, they say, we commit ourselves not to separate what God has joined together. We are not going to do anything to separate what God has brought us together. God brought us together. We are not going to try to separate from each other. They commit to that. That's what I just read. Two, we commit ourselves to love and respect one another. Do you? Or do you become disrespectful to each other after marriage? You've committed on the wedding day that you're going to love and respect each other. What happened? What happened to your commitment? You changed your mind? Oh, you like someone else? Oh. My neighbor is, better, is nice to me. You're not. Oh, oh go, on, go and marry all your neighbors then. <laughs> Three, commit ourselves to be affectionate. What do I just say here? Huh? What do I say here? Let the husband provide his wife the affection due her. We commit ourselves to be affectionate and compassionate towards one another. Affectionate and compassionate, that means we be nice. I show mercy. My husband made a mistake. I chopped his head off. No, come on, relax. You've got to be nice, compassionate, show mercy. Okay, husband, that's okay. We all make mistakes, you know. We, you're not the only one that makes mistakes. I make mistakes too. I forgive you. I love you. Four. Commit ourselves to give. And forgive. You know, she did something. I will never forgive her till I die. She is you. If you don't forgive her, you are not forgiving yourself. And forgive and satisfy the needs of marital life. Whatever the marital life needs, you got to provide that. Five. We commit ourselves to change if needed in order to pursue, in order to pursue godly life. You know what pursue means? In order to go after godly life. Pursue it, go for it. Search for it. So, we commit to change if needed in order to maintain godly life. In order to maintain Christ in our lives, we need to change. And if need be, I will. You know, I'm used to that I'm Mr. Perfect. Um, I, I, never, I, I never say sorry to no one because I'm always right. She's dumb. I'm the smart one. Or he's an idiot. I'm the one who runs the show. I'm the one who's got the brain. He is brainless. Well, guess what? You didn't have the brain when you decided to marry him. So when you say he doesn't have brain, that means you don't have brain. Because you married someone who has no brain, so you don't have a brain. 
Isn't it? Because you are cleaved. You are joined together. Whatever you say to each other is going to come back to you because it's you. The two are you. One, 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 one. So you say to your wife, you're stupid. You're saying to your, hus your, your hus uh, the husband, you're saying to yourself, you're stupid. And if you say to your wife, you're beautiful. Now, we go forth. These five commitments are the core commandments mentioned by the priest, which I just read. When you come and be married to the church, those five commitments are the core, the heart of the commandments which the priest mentions to the man and the woman, the husband and wife. And they both say with a big smile and a, ha and a shaky hand, I do. You know, when I hold the, uh, the husband's or the, or, the, or the bride's, you know, the, bri uh, the bride's hand, because they're so nervous, sweaty. Yeah, very sweaty. And sometimes, sometimes I, I see like the, uh, the man is very nervous. I say, mm, she should be nervous, not you. <laughs> anyway. These five commandments, or the ten commit, five commitments, are the core commandments which the priest gives at the wedding day. Then, if you commit yourself really and be joined together by forgiving each other and being compassionate and nice to each other and love and respect and all that, that cleaving is going to lead you to uniting. It's going to lead you to uniting. Now, we're going to go to uniting. What is uniting or unity? Unity is intimacy. Now, intimacy is the ultimate level in love. You know, being intimate, that means you lose yourself. You don't see yourself, you see her, and she sees you. That is intimate. That is, uniting means really one. You know, when the, when the love, when the love is so strong, you will forget yourself. Some saints, or a lot of, all the saints, all the saints, when they were intimate with Christ, they lost, they forgot themselves. There was one saint called Amba Bishoy. Now, Amba Bishoy was in the 4th century in Egypt. He, when he used to pray, when he used to pray, guys, he would stand in this desert. He used to stand in this desert and pray. He was a monk in the desert. He would stand and then he would open his eyes the following day 24 hours he was on his feet praying he forgot himself because that is intimacy intimacy is where you are in the high high level of spirituality you are f swimming in the love of Christ you forget about yourself and, and Jesus is like that when you get too close to him oh, he is magnificent because I had some encounters, bits and pieces here and there. Yeah. I can tell you, Jesus will stop your mind, will blow you right out. You will forget everything. You will lose everything. Jesus' presence, when you are really, really intimate with Christ, man, he's amazing. Love is amazing. Love, true love, makes you lose yourself. Now, unity is intimacy, which is the ultimate level in love and, and joining together. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, is taking the two, husband and wife, into one. We have three and three in one. So, on the cross, Jesus poured his blood to what? Unite you to him. So, he married the girl and he married the boy. He is uniting you, the soul of a human being, is being united to Christ through his precious blood. So you are already married to Jesus before you are married to your partner on earth. So who is bringing the two, the boy and the girl together and uniting them? Jesus, the true bridegroom. So that is why even when death separates the two, the other party is still united to Jesus. He's still married to Jesus, whether it's boy or girl. Every single soul that is baptized in Christ is the bride of Christ. Every single soul, boys and girls who are baptized in Christ, are the bride of Jesus Christ. So Jesus, out of the love that he has for you, he brings these two on earth and unite them in him. And unite them in him. A Christian marriage is supposed to be built 
on Christ. So when you are built on Christ, you don't do things the way you want to do them. You do things the way Christ wants them to be done. But do we? No. And that is why we have separation. So unity is Christ bringing the two into one. The three becomes God is one, the bride and the groom all being united as one. That is why, my beloved, when a wife leaves the husband for whatever reason, except adultery, when she walks away because he didn't buy her a four-wheel drive, or he didn't take her to a certain wedding, or he doesn't go and visit her parents, his in-laws, and she's sick of him, so she walks away from him, guess what? She's not separated, neither from Jesus nor from her husband. Jesus, one hand holds the husband, the other hand holds the wife. When the wife walks away, unfair, Jesus is still holding the husband, and he's got his hand opened, waiting for the wife to come back. And then she wanders off, and she marries someone else. Oops. Oops. She's not separated. And the husband is still waiting for the wife to come back. So she, she's breaking his, the husband's heart, but above all, she's breaking Christ's heart. Because he loved these two, and out of his love, he wanted them to be one, together on earth, and one in him, at the same time. So when you walk away unfairly, you are breaking Jesus' heart. Jesus Christ is reality in marriage. And if we forget about him, our marriage will dissolve. Jesus Christ is reality in marriage. And if we forget him, our marriage will fall apart. Because what made this marriage possible? Christ. What joined these two different individuals into one? Christ. Who did you build your life on? Christ. And as a Christian married couple, you forget about Christ, your foundation. Guess what? Your house will collapse. And isn't Christ missing in, in, in our families? Well, huge way is missing. We argue and talk about everything except Jesus. And the moment we want to just mention Jesus, oh, all hell loose, you know, get slow. World War III erupts. You and your Jesus, I don't want to talk about Jesus, um, leave Jesus to you. I don't have the time for Jesus. But you were married in Jesus. You were united in Jesus. And you want to live your married life without Jesus. Well, guess what? The devil is going to take over. And what is the devil going to do? He's known to divide, breaks, destroys, kills. And that's what happens, what is happening to the Christian marriages are being destroyed, separated, being killed because Christ is being left out. Yet he is the foundation. All right. Look at this. St. John Chrysostom, by the, uh, guys, St. John Chrysostom is, uh, is a very powerful saint in the fourth century. He was the patriarch or the head of the church in Constantinople in the fourth century, which is Istanbul, Turkey at the moment. So he was, he was a, a, one of the greatest, uh, theolo you know, very, 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 very spiritual man, uh, very holy man of God, and he had, when he used to give his sermons, very powerful. He's got books, very powerful books, very powerful. So St. John Chrysostom talks about marriage. Look what he says. He said about marriage, it's a, a nuptial community or marital community, um, which is a prophetic figure of the kingdom of God in which the ultimate unity and community between the maleness and the femaleness will be in God. In other words, what he's saying, it is the, um, it is the unity and the community between the male and the female in God. Marriage that is built on Christ is the is kingdom of God on earth. When you see a married couple that are really living Christ, both of them, when you see a married couple, husband and wife, that are really living Christ, 
and they have Christ, the bond, the glue between them, you are witnessing and experiencing God's kingdom on earth. Because what is God up there? Family. What do we say? Husband, wife, Christ. Three in one. Up there when you go, you're going to see a lot of saints. But you're going to see them all Christ. And when you see a married couple in love, you will see Jesus really. You won't see them. You will see Jesus. Because who joined them together? Christ. You will see the light of Christ shining through them. You will witness the presence of Jesus, the kingdom of God, right before your eyes. The family on earth is supposed to be God's kingdom. For other people to see and learn what they will see when they go up there. When the husband, when the husband loves the wife in Jesus, and when the, when the wife loves the husband in Jesus, who are you going to see? Jesus. Not the husband and wife. You're going to see Jesus. And when the children, when the children see that from mom and dad, guess what? They will be 100% in absolute obedience and respect to their parents. But if they see otherwise, they're going to go their ways. Each will take a direction. Um, now this is the ideal marriage. But in our days, as we said, it's not the case. Unfortunately, it's not the case. That's why there are so many divorces. I used to work in the Commonwealth Bank. And I worked as a branch manager. And I worked in, the, in their head office. And uh, once I did a, a contract job for about five, six months. And it was... Um, was to do with home loan files. You know, after that, people buy a house and the house gets settled and they walk in there. Those files are still not finished. So they come to us, we finish them off. Whatever issues there are and problems. Guys, probably there was tens of thousands of files, hundreds of thousands. The, the building is huge and it had a lot of files. I can, I can tell you that out of 100 files, 50 of them were divorce cases. Property being sold because husband and wife are leaving. More than 50% of marriages end up with divorce in Australia. Australia-wide, more than 50%. Probably around 200,000 divorce cases go through a courthouse a month. And unfortunately, a big number of them are Christian marriages. Christian marriages. For one simple reason... Because they are not built on Christ. Or they have left Christ out. That is why, guys, whenever you want to choose a partner, choose your partner in Jesus. Don't look at, the, at their looks. Don't look at what position they hold. Don't look at how much money they have. Don't look at what kind of car they drive. Don't look at uh, whatever. Whatever is external from outside is only temporary. Even the looks, even the beauty is going to fade away. As I said, after marriage you'll see her without makeup. She's different. You will see him in a different way after marriage. It's a different wine. It's a different taste. But what really lasts, what is really beautiful and foundational is the Christ who has joined you together. Build your life on Jesus and keep it that way. Maintain it that way. Because when Jesus is with you throughout your married life, no matter what happens, you will overcome your obstacles. Because nothing stands in Jesus' way. And when you have Jesus in your heart, you will be able to lower yourself before your wife and say, I'm sorry. You will, know how, you will understand how to forgive, how to forget, how to let go, and how to be humble. Because Jesus is beautiful. But when Jesus is out, it is me. And me is very, very bad. I only love myself, I hate everyone. Somebody hurts me, I want to blow them up. But when you have Christ, problems can be solved. When the relationship gets sick, go to the doctor, Jesus. Go to the church and get it fixed up. Finally, guys, if you ever have an issue, don't let it be more than three months 
not being solved. Any issue that happens at home, if it passes three months, it's going to be very hard to solve. Very hard. So within three months, it should have been solved by the church. Uh, they come to us, uh, we've got a, I've got a family problem, like the wife or the husband. Uh, whatever. Uh, we've been going on like this for the last two years. Hello? Why are you coming now? You should have come day one. After one week. After one month, you should have come. If pain persists, see a doctor. <laughs> Is that what they say? Take a Panadol, but if pain persists, go on and get some antibiotics, you know. Get the heavy-duty stuff. But to finish it off, finish it off, finish it off. You want to meet a partner? Don't do it while he's still very bambino. You know, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I'm in love. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> You're going to change. But when you find a partner, be serious about that. And always have Jesus. Always have Jesus, my beloved. Never fear someone who fears God. But fear the one who doesn't. Never fear someone who fears God. But fear the one who doesn't. And it's a serious issue. You enter a relationship, you have to be serious about it. It's not a joke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. Amen.